Okay, so welcome back to this next video in which we are discussing heart failure and heart failure medications. Okay, right. So in the previous video, uh, we started our discussion of how chronic arterial hypertension is going to lead to uh, heart failure. Okay, and we saw what would happen if there were no neurohormonal mechanisms. Okay, so we saw that chronic hypertension is going to reduce the size of the left ventricular stroke volume simply because the left ventricle is going to have a harder time pumping blood into uh, a very hypertensive arterial system. Okay, then what's going to happen is you're going to get pulmonary congestion, okay, so the pulmonary venous pressure is going to go up because less blood is being moved out of the pulmonary venous system into the arterial system. That's going to cause pulmonary arterial pressure to go up and that's going to reduce down uh, the right ventricular stroke volume, okay, so that it and the left ventricular stroke volume are nicely in balance now. Okay, because you can't have the right ventricle pumping out more blood than the left ventricle. That's just not sustainable. They need to be in balance. Okay, uh, then when the right ventricular stroke volume goes down, that's going to lead to the central venous pressure going up. It's going to cause systemic congestion. Okay. Right, we've then discussed that there are some plus sides to this, okay, so there's something that will stop it plummeting down to ridiculously low levels, okay, and the things that are stopping it plummeting down from ridiculously low levels are that um, when you raise pulmonary venous pressure and central venous pressure, what that's going to mean is that the end diastolic volumes in the right ventricle and the left ventricle are going to be increased, and then by the Frank Starling law of the heart, when you increase the end diastolic volumes, that increases the preload on these ventricles, okay, the stretch in the wall of the ventricles, and that that then causes these walls to contract harder, and therefore that will help to bring up stroke volume slightly, okay, so basically these will not bring stroke volume back up to what it should be, but they will stop it from plummeting to ridiculously low levels, okay, so they'll help to maintain it at a reasonable, respectable level. Okay, so that's what would happen if the heart was allowed to deal with this on its own. The stroke volume would go down, cardiac output would go down, but it wouldn't deteriorate. The condition wouldn't deteriorate as badly as it is going to because of the neurohormonal mechanisms. Okay, so now let's move our attention on to the neurohormonal mechanisms. Let's add them into the picture. Okay, so there are three that we're going to discuss, which are the sympathetic nervous system, okay, uh, the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system, and then we're going to do antidiuretic hormone as well. So neurohormonal mechanisms, and I'll just make sure this is at the right height. Okay, right, uh, so we're going to start off then with the sympathetic nervous system. So, why do the neurohormonal mechanisms activate in the first place? Well, basically, it's because your mean arterial pressure has gone down. And you might say, but it was too high in the first place, okay? If we're bringing it back down to a normal level, surely that should be a good thing. But of course, the body has adapted to the aberrant hypertensive state, okay? So it now thinks that your normal blood pressure is that too high level, okay? So it's going to try and maintain the blood pressure at that ridiculously hypertensive level. Okay, so what's going to happen is when the mean arterial pressure goes down, it's going to activate something known as the carotid sinus. Okay, so let me show you where the carotid sinus is. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw someone's head and neck uh, where we're viewing it from the right-hand side. Okay, so start off, I'll draw this here maybe. Okay, so here is the neck, here is the back of their head, Okay, here's the forehead, here is the orbit, okay, here is, whoops, <laughs> here is their nose, <laughs> broken now, because uh, I got a little bit carried away, uh, then um, here is their lips and chin, and there we go, a little bit of a thin neck, but never mind, okay, um, so in the neck, there is a very large artery known as the carotid artery, and of course we're looking at the right hand side, so we're seeing the right carotid artery, and uh, specifically it should be called the common carotid artery. Okay, so this is the right common carotid artery here. Okay, now 
at around the level of the thyroid cartilage, what's going to happen is the common carotid artery is going to bifurcate into two separate arteries. So here it is in red. Okay, what's now going to happen is it's going to bifurcate into two. Okay, one that's going to go forward, that's the external carotid artery, and the other that's going to go backwards, that's the internal carotid artery. So this one here, this is the right external carotid artery. Okay, so I might just, well, I'll just write it out in full. This is the external carotid artery. Okay, so I will colour the external carotid artery in, in green there. Okay, and then going backwards, you have the internal carotid artery. Now, at the very base of the internal carotid artery, you have the carotid sinus. Okay, that bulge that I have drawn there, that is the carotid sinus. So the carotid sinus is basically just an expansion of the internal carotid artery. So this structure here that I've now coloured in in vivid purple, that is the carotid sinus and it's at the base of the internal carotid artery or at the start of the internal carotid artery if you like. Okay, right. So this structure which is bilaterally located, so you have a right carotid sinus and a left carotid sinus, okay, uh, these are going to be blood pressure sensors, they're going to be measuring blood pressure, arterial blood pressure, so when mean arterial pressure is going to fall, um, as it has done here, what's going to happen is the uh, carotid sinus is going to send messages up to the brain, and it's going to activate uh, certain neurohormonal mechanisms. Principally, it's going to activate the sympathetic nervous system. Okay, so it's going to go up to the brain, and then the brain is going to activate the sympathetic nervous system. Okay, the SNS for short. So, how is the SNS going to act on tissues? Okay, well firstly I'll tell you which tissues it's going to act on. It's going to act on the heart, principally. It's going to have effects on the heart to try and bring blood pressure back up. It's also going to act on uh, vascular uh, systems, so blood vessels. And it's also going to act on the kidney. Now, whenever you're talking about the sympathetic nervous system, there are two ways that it actually achieves its effect. Okay, one is that it can have neurons which actually directly innervate the target. Okay, so whatever it is, whether it be the heart or the uh, muscle cells of the arterioles. Okay, so you send nerves right onto the target. Okay, and they, those nerves are going to release uh, a neurotransmitter known as noradrenaline. Okay, so one way the sympathetic nervous system can have its effect is by having nerves that directly innervate the target and these neurons are going to release uh, the neurotransmitter noradrenaline. Now, um, noradrenaline also has a new name, okay, that's very popular in the States, uh, which is norepinephrine. Okay, so I'll give you both names. Okay, so noradrenaline or norepinephrine. We will abbreviate noradrenaline down to NA from now on. Okay, right, so N for nor and A for adrenaline. Okay, um, the other way the sympathetic nervous system is going to have its effects is by activating the adrenal medulla to release adrenaline into the blood and then the adrenaline can act on the tissues of the target um, tissue, the cells of the target tissue rather. Okay, so let me just draw a little picture of the adrenal gland here. Okay, and of course you have two adrenal glands, one on each side, and they sit atop the kidneys. Okay, so the adrenal glands can be divided up into two main portions. The center portion here is the adrenal medulla. Okay, and I'll color in the adrenal medulla in orange, like so. And then the outer portion which I'll colour in in blue here. This is the adrenal cortex. Okay, so all of this is the adrenal cortex. Right. Now, it's the medulla that is responsible for releasing uh, adrenaline. Okay, we will see the function of part of the cortex later on when we come on to the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. Okay, it, the cortex releases steroid hormones rather than adrenaline and noradrenaline. Oh, sorry, not, a, not noradrenaline. The medulla releases just adrenaline. Okay, it might have a little bit of noradrenaline in there as well. Okay, so adrenaline, which is also called epinephrine. Okay, right. So 
then the adrenaline or epinephrine, whatever you want to call it, uh, is going to go into the blood and it's then going to be delivered to the cells of the tissues that the sympathetic nervous system is going to act on, uh, such as the heart, uh, the smooth muscle cells of the vascular system, uh, the kidney, okay, and it's going to have its effect. So noradrenaline and adrenaline are going to achieve the effect. So let's now talk about the effects that these um, neurotransmitters are going to have. Okay, so we'll start by looking at the effect on the heart of sympathetic stimulation. Okay, so what does sympathetic stimulation do to the heart? Well, it has two major effects. Firstly, it makes the heart beat faster. Okay, and I should, just before we talk about this, talk about which receptors are actually present uh, on uh, the heart muscle cells. Okay, so there are three receptors that are found for adrenaline on heart muscle cells, okay, but there is one main receptor that is responsible for most of the actual physiological functions of uh, the adrenaline and noradrenaline that's going to be stimulating these cells, which is the beta-1 receptor, okay? So there are many different adrenaline receptors and the beta-1 adrenoreceptor, which I'll abbreviate down to AR, is the main one that you find on cardiomyocytes, okay? Now, it's a G-protein coupled receptor, so it has the characteristic seven membrane-spanning alpha helices, like so. So if this is the cell membrane, this line here, then the receptor is going to look something like this. It's going to have seven membrane-spanning alpha helices, which are going to cross the membrane. And you'll always have the amino terminus extracellularly and the carboxy terminus intracellularly. Okay, and the beta-1 adrenaline receptor is coupled to the GS cascade. Okay, and we will see how the beta-1 adrenaline receptor achieves some of its functions in the cardiomyocytes later on. Okay, I should also mention now that you have alpha-1 adrenaline receptors also on uh, cardiomyocytes, which are also G-protein coupled receptors, but coupled to a different cascade. They're coupled to GQ and then also beta-2 adrenoreceptors on the cardiomyocytes, which are also coupled to GS. Now, beta-1 and beta-2, those are a specific receptor, okay? Alpha-1 is a class of receptors. There are three different types of alpha-1 receptors, okay? They all do the same thing, which is why often people just say alpha-1 adrenoreceptor and count all the three of them as alpha-1 adrenoreceptors. But there are actually three different uh, receptors which are all counted as alpha-1 adrenoreceptors, whereas beta-1 adrenoreceptor and beta-2 adrenoreceptor, those are just one gene coding for one protein. Okay, right. So, on the heart then, you have these three types of adrenoreceptors, but the principal one that you have is the beta-1 adrenoreceptor. We'll come back to these later on because they're important in the hypertrophy potentially. Okay. Um, but for now, the beta-1 adrenoreceptor is going to be the important one. And the effects that it's going to have are that it's going to increase the heart rate by increasing the firing rate of the sinoatrial node. Okay, so the heart is going to start beating faster. Now that's a good idea if you want to raise blood pressure back up. Okay, because how can you raise blood pressure? Well, you can either increase total peripheral resistance or you can increase cardiac output. Remember our equation. This is all you can do. You can alter cardiac output or total peripheral resistance. How can you change cardiac output? Either by increasing stroke volume or by making the heart beat faster. And that's what we're going to do. We're going to make the heart beat faster. So heart rate is going to go up because of the uh, sympathetic stimulation onto the heart. Okay, now, in a heart failure, if the hypertension is going to be chronic, okay, if, the, if we're going to have this chronic hypertension, then the sympathetic nervous system is going to have to be chronically active, okay, and therefore you're going to be getting heart rate being elevated chronically, and that's known as tachycardia, so when you've got an elevated heart rate for extended periods of time, that's known as tachycardia. Okay, so you're going to get tachycardia of the heart, an elevated heart rate. In addition, sympathetic stimulation on the heart also actually increases the force of contraction of the individual cardiomyocytes. Now, I'll introduce you to another piece of terminology here. So, uh, another way to say the contractility of cardiomyocytes is with this word inotropy. 
Okay, so inotropy means how hard the cardiomyocytes contract. Okay, so it's effectively um, means the same thing as contractivity. Okay, so beta-1 adrenoreceptors increase inotropy. They increase the force with which cardiomyocytes contract. Okay, and that's also going to help to increase our cardiac output. Uh, because remember, the whole r reason that our cardiac output was decreased was that the left ventricle was struggling to pump blood out into this arterial system with uh, too high arterial blood pressure. Now, if our cardiomyocytes are capable of contracting harder, then that's going to help to uh, help the left ventricle to deal with this elevated mean arterial blood pressure. Okay, and we will see how the beta-1 adrenoreceptor actually increases the force of contraction of the cardiomyocytes later on. Okay, right, so that's the effect of sympathetic stimulation on the heart. Let's now talk about the effect of the sympathetic stimulation on the vascular system then. Okay, so uh, smooth muscle cells surrounding blood vessels have alpha-1 adrenoreceptors on their surface. And these trigger those smooth muscle cells to contract. So if I just draw a picture of this, let's have a little arteriole here. Basically, arterioles have a layer of smooth muscle cells. Okay, so in fact, I'll draw this better. I'll draw the endothelial cells on here. So you have the endothelial cells. Let me just remind you of the structure of an arteriole. Okay, so here are the endothelial cells right in the center. Then surrounding the endothelial cells, you have the basement membrane, which is what all the endothelial cells are sitting on. Okay, so this is the basement membrane, which is often abbreviated down to BM. These are the endothelial cells, which are often abbreviated down to ECs. Okay, and here, this layer now is going to be smooth muscle cells, which are often abbreviated down to SMCs. Now, these smooth muscle cells will be... Um, arranged in circles, okay, so you'll have them arranged circularly like so. So here's one smooth muscle cell, here's the next, okay, and it will go on forming an entire ring of smooth muscle cells like so. Okay, now, can you imagine what's going to happen if one, well, if all of these smooth muscle cells contract? Well, if they all contract, all of their lengths decrease and that means the circumference of the entire ring is going to go down. And when you decrease the circumference of the entire ring, that's going to constrict the diameter. Okay, so you're going to constrict the lumen. So basically, stimulation of alpha-1 adrenoreceptors on the smooth muscle cells of arterioles is going to cause that arteriole to constrict. And that's going to reduce blood flow to uh, whichever area this arteriole supplies. Okay, so, particularly, you have alpha-1 adrenoreceptors located on the smooth muscle cells to arterioles supplying the gastrointestinal tract. Okay, and this means that you're going to reduce blood flow to the gastrointestinal tract. Now, firstly, that's going to help shunt our reduced cardiac output towards the brain and heart, the more important tissues, okay? But in addition, it's actually going to help raise mean arterial blood pressure because we have effectively increased total peripheral resistance. Remember, total peripheral resistance meant how difficult was it for blood to return from the arterial system to the venous system, okay? We have now made it more difficult by closing certain arterioles, okay? So now it's more difficult for blood to return from the arterial system to the venous system. Okay, right. Uh, so that's also going to help bring mean arterial blood pressure back up. Okay, right. So I think we'll call it there for this video. And in the next video, what we'll do is look at the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system.